Welcome to The Teaching Curve, a podcast exploring the pedagogy of global politics and international relations, produced under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative of the International Studies Association and made available through the ISA Professional Resource Center. I'm Jamie Free, Associate Provost and Professor of Global Politics at Bridgewater College. Each episode of The Teaching Curve is a conversation with a thoughtful and innovative teacher of international studies. The goal is to celebrate and inspire pedagogical creativity by reflecting with great teachers on the art of teaching and learning. To teach is a transitive verb. The act requires not just content, but a relationship with others who have an essential role in whether, in the end, teaching actually takes place. Great teachers understand the importance to their teaching identity of students, not just in the abstract or in the aggregate, but as individuals who bring to the interactions their own experiences, perspectives, and unique creative minds. This episode is a conversation with Dr. Franklin Obang Odun. Franklin is the Helsinki Institute of Sustainability Science Associate Professor of Global Development Studies at the University of Helsinki in Finland. He's a prolific author and has published extensively on the political economy of development, urban and regional economics, natural resources, and the environment. He's a fellow of the Teachers Academy at the University of Helsinki we're talking to him today because he is the recipient of ISA's 2021 Deborah Gurner Award for Innovative Teaching. Our conversation centers on a couple of concepts that Franklin uses to describe his teaching. The first is pedagogical pluralism, and we talk about how that influences relationships between teachers and students. The conceptual framework of pedagogical citizenship helps us to understand how Franklin diversifies his syllabi and how he approaches teaching. Lastly, we talk about the benefits of and processes for truly empowered student feedback. Dr. Franklin Obango Doom, thank you very much for joining me on the teaching curve. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm delighted to be here, Jeremy. I have watched previous uh, editions of the teaching curve, and it is really a privilege to take my turn today. So One of the questions that I ask everybody to get started with is to describe their role and their institution by describing their students. I think that that's a great way to get to know what you're doing and where you're at. So please, uh, Franklin, describe your students to me. Um, I teach theories of development, cities in the global south, and the final master's research seminar in global development studies Two master's students. I think in America, you call them graduate uh, students. Mm -hmm. But mostly I I taught at various universities in Australia, including the University of Technology, Sydney, where I was director of higher degree research programs. And during this time, uh, my students were mostly undergraduate uh, students. Uh, They they were mostly undergraduates. Um, My teaching interest reflects my research centered on the political economy of development, urban and regional economics, natural resource, and the environment. But my students um, are not necessarily doing uh, work in these uh, fields. My courses are compulsory ones, and so I get students from across uh, various, various fields. And uh, tell me a little bit about where the students come from. Are they mostly from Finland? Do they come from across Europe? Where do you get students from? Our students have diverse backgrounds. Yes, there are many from Finland, uh, but they are, we also have students who, who are from elsewhere uh, in Europe and in the global uh, north. Uh, simultaneously, we have students uh, from the global south the rich diversity amongst our students is indeed one of our strengths in global development studies. Absolutely, I can see how that would really help to bring in stories and different experiences and perspectives that would really enrich the conversations and and the experience, not just of the students, but of you too in the classroom. Absolutely, Uh, especially for uh, global development uh, studies, as you, as you suggest, we are all products of our environments and of our contests. So it is really a pleasure 
um, and an honor to be able to be part of this diverse you know, body uh, of students. They bring to our study um, uh, the, the rich variety, the rich variety across the whole world. And uh, the conversation across the global south uh, and between the global south and the global north can really be empower empowering, not just for the student, but also for us as teachers. Are there experiences that you had as a student that steered you not necessarily toward particular practices, but maybe away from particular pedagogical practices? Um, I think actually both. There are those practices which uh, left a lasting impression on me and for which reason uh, they have uh, percolated my own teaching. Mm. And then there are those <laughs> that um, didn't leave so great an impression on me, and so I try to avoid. I I I, I could I could des describe uh, both a, a, a little a little bit. Please. Um, I use stories quite often in my teaching. I also find repetition quite helpful in my teaching practice. I learned both of them from former teachers. Um, my teacher in um, advanced valuation and landlord, Dr. Hammond, was such a talented storyteller. Uh, so was my uh, advisor, uh, Professor Frank uh, Stewart. I learned from both of them the value of recapping previous classes and the need to link previous classes to current mm. one and then subsequent uh, classes. I also try to be quite organized and <laughs> prepared before uh, and during uh, my classes. I got this from Professor Lei Yan Zan, uh, who, taught, who taught us uh, managing uh, the city economy. Um, she still left room for flexibility and experimentation as I do uh, now. I try to steer off pedagogical uh, monism, this idea that um, uh, what the teacher presents cannot be questioned or that the students are not encouraged to read outside of what the, the, the teacher teaches um, in class. Um, and this uh, idea that the students need only to be able to, to repeat or regurgitate um, what the teacher uh, presents uh, uh, to them. Instead, I try to build more and more on pedagogical uh, pluralism and pedagogical citizenship as my mm. own teaching uh, philosophies and, and, and which inform my own teaching uh, practice. I'm fascinated by both of those uh, terms. I think they're really interesting. So what do you mean by pluralism? Um, in political economy, uh, as you know, um, one of uh, the groups uh, for which we direct our challenge um, uh, is the neoclassical economist. The neoclassical economist um, or the mainstream economies more broadly, um, or mainstream economics as a field more generally, is quite characterized by pedagogical monism. This idea that there is only one way of doing economics. Um, and that students must suspend all disbelief while they study uh, economics. Mm. Uh, this pedagogical monism is questioned by uh, political economists who say that no, for uh, every economic problem, it is possible to 
um, understand or to explain what is happening uh, from a variety of schools uh, of thought. And schools of thought themselves are informed by particular uh, political economic uh, interest and have developed within particular uh, context. So political economists then tend to develop pedagogical pluralism. They tend to um, value critical uh, thinking. Um, the idea that the, the students can call into question what is a dominant uh, point uh, of view. So it is pretty common for a good uh, teacher informed by pedagogical pluralism to set readings which are, say, um, uh, contrasting, mm -hmm. which ch with, uh, one reading which challenges the other. So they draw the readings not only from neoclassical economics, but they could pair a neoclassical economics point of view with, say, a Marxian point of view, or we say, mm -hmm. an ancient point of view, or we say, a feminist point of view. That goes very far. But it does not go as far as I would like in the courses that I teach, for which diversity, for example, is an important value, diversity and inclusion. Mm. So then I try to develop pedagogical citizenship as a much wider, a more inclusive pedagogical framework. So not only would I say uh, pair readings that challenge uh, each other, I would also be sensitive to whether these readings I have that I, I'll be sensitive and um, encouraging uh, of the practice of including diverse voices amongst mm. the body of readings that I provide the students. So it's not enough to include different schools of economic thought or diametrically opposed different uh, schools of economic thought. But but it, it is necessary to do so, but, but it, it's not sufficient. It, it, it's useful to bring to the table voices that are usually missing, at least from the Western Academy, but also from the from, from Academy uh, elsewhere, uh, indigenous voices, mm. voices of women, and those that are usually in, in, invisibilized. So that would be how I would I dis, that is how I distinguish between pedagogical um, uh, pluralism and pedagogical uh, citizenship. I like both, but I consider ped pedagogical um, citizenship to be a further extension of the challenge to pedagogical monism. Mm. Well, and, and I can also imagine, I mean, I, I think the term citizenship is very evocative because it, it gets at the relationships that the members of the community there have both to the material and to each other, that they have responsibilities and they have rights. And so how does citizenship, uh, how does that translate into practices within the classroom? Indeed, that's a, that's a good, a good, a good uh, uh, complimentary point there, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Um, in the class, I try to make the readings that I set for the students, the questions that I ask, the lectures that mm. I, the analogies that I use, the stories that I tell, reflect the diversity of the content mm. that we discuss, reflect the the identities of the student body that we have. I think that's very uh, important. Uh, it's not always easy, uh, but as an aspiration and as a practice, I think it's very useful indeed. 
What is that set up in the relationship between you as an instructor and the students? How, what does that relationship look like in your courses? And um, how does that, the, the pluralism and the citizenship translate into those kinds of things? It, um, in, in my classes, um, the lecture, the former lecture is not the only learning device. This is in sharp contrast to what happens in, uh, in the most mainstream economics uh, uh, courses where the lecture is the primary teaching and learning uh, mm. practice. Or, right. um, in my class, there is indeed the lecture, but it is only one component of our meeting. We also have um, a, a discussion or a tutorial session and we usually have a debate session. So, and all these are open to critical discussion mm. and reflection. To take the debate, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it goes without saying that um, the two, two groups of students who are debating uh, emotion uh, are adjudicated by another body of students acting as judges. And then uh, those, audience who are asking questions. But even my lecture is not beyond critical reflections. I mm. usually say to the students, you, you know, just put my lecture in the middle of the class. Is, forget <laughs> the fact that it was Franklin or Binodum who gave mm. uh, the lecture. You are invited to look and, and, and to think about the, the lecture critically, because in my class, uh, the, 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 the teaching goal is to criticize every development theory and to theorize every development question. So that means that the students have right, have the fullest of rights as citizens to call into question mm. even, even the lecture based on what they have read. But, but, but we, we do so respectfully. We try to develop as what we call critical listening um, skills. Normally we emphasize critical thinking skills, but in my classes, he also emphasize critical listening skills. We are encouraged to listen respectfully, even if critically, uh, mm. to what we all have to uh, see. So, yeah, I, I think that that's a very important piece. I, I try to use the, uh, the metaphor in my classes that uh, I want the students to treat both all of the readings and all of the things they hear from me, mm. uh, all of the authors and me, as if we are used car dealers. Uh, and they have to, if they're going to buy one of these ideas, they have to open up the hood of the car and look at things and kick the tires and take it for a test drive and see how it works. Because, uh, and that applies not just to the different perspectives that we have, but to what the, the things that I'm bringing into the classroom as well. Yes, that's a... It's an, it's, an, it's an interesting it's an interesting metaphor <laughs> I, I bet if we, if we if we use it in a sustainability class we need to call into question the car itself <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and driving itself I say. That, that's a great point that's a great point yes yes well and, and I know you and I have talked before about how we might improve the feedback that we get from students and and uh so I, can you talk a little bit about how that works in practice and what you think might be better? Yes, in general, I think across the world, it's quite difficult to, um, to obtain feedback from students. The response rate uh, from student feedback service can be quite low. Um, I try to address this problem by using these principles of citizenship by letting the students know how I have in fact acted on the mm. feedback they have given me to let them know that I got this idea from you mm. and 
I am going to put this into practice. This, I think, helps the, the students to know that their feedback is really valued. And, 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 and I know this because that has also come through uh, the feedback that the students feel that uh, it's not a waste of time for them to try to give uh, feedback. And it's helped in, in a way to improve uh, the response rate as the students re really appreciate that I, I, tr I try at least to uh, implement what, um, what the, um, you know, the, 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 the suggestions that uh, mm. The, uh, the, the offer. And I think, Jeremy, you and I have also discussed alternatives to traditional feed, individualized uh, feedback. Um, I think what we were, we were trying to do uh, was developing uh, focus group based feedback. And mm -hmm. as, as our, our preliminary results show, students are quite excited about uh, this alternative or this addition to traditional feedback. So what we are trying to do, I mean, I think is not to substitute, you know, the traditional ways of obtaining individualized feedback from students, but to complement uh, this practice with an additional uh, way of getting more collective, collectivized uh, or uh, focus group based or focus group based, yes, focus group based uh, feedback from, from the students. And I, and, I, and I look forward to, you know, sharing with you how, how I go with, the, with that practice when I actually put it, put it into action uh, this, <laughs> this period or this semester. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I think that there's ways in which the students will be reinforced in their sense of responsibility and have ideas that bounce off other people's ideas in these kind of formats that uh, that may be much more productive uh, of, of engaging their creativity about what it means to be a student in those courses by helping each other to think those things through. So I, I too, Franklin, I'm looking forward to sharing our results with each other and and eventually, of course, with everybody else on trying this, this out. That's, 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 I look forward to it. Um, so tell me how you hope your students describe your courses. Exactly as I intend the courses to be seen and to be appreciated by the, by the students as, as global, as interactive, and as critical. If the students were to add that, uh, you know, the courses are empowering and they are interesting and they are and, and they are relevant. I consider these all to be, you know, a bonus. I consider that <laughs> that that means that I have exceeded um, uh, the expectations that I have for for myself. Terrific. Well, uh, Franklin Obango Doom, thank you so much for being part of us, sharing time with me and with the audience. I, I know that everybody will find really interesting pieces out of this interview. And I, I really appreciate you coming to do this. It's been a pleasure and, I, and, and I, I'm looking forward to, um, you know, to sharing with you uh, uh, more, uh, you know, teaching, uh, teaching experiences uh, in, in, in the future. Thank you very much for having me. Just a brief advertisement for a virtual innovative pedagogy conference, which the International Studies Association will sponsor on Saturday, August 6th. The workshops will be held twice in two different time zones to try to accommodate people from all around the world. Look for more information to come out from ISA in the coming weeks, and I hope you'll join us for the conference. The Teaching Curve is produced in collaboration with the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative of the International Studies Association and made available through ISA's Professional Resource Center. Special thanks to Alex Walker, Sarah Dorr, and the Innovative Pedagogy Conference Steering Committee. If you have suggestions for future episodes, or comments about this one, please email at teachingcurve at isonet.org, or you can tweet at us, at teachingcurve. Thanks for joining us again on The Teaching Curve, and remember, learn something every time you teach.